The word of the Lord is found as uh, Reverend Monta led us in the reading and hearing of from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is often referred to as an eagle eye prophet in that he speaks of Jesus wide centuries before he came into this world. And what's amazing is that Isaiah speaks not only with clarity, not only with certainty, but he speaks of Jesus centuries before his birth with a contemporary bend. He does not say unto us a son will be born, unto us a son will be given. That's futuristic. But Isaiah speaks of Jesus in contemporary vernacular. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. It's almost as if he sees Jesus so clearly that Jesus is right there with him. And isn't that good news? That Jesus is right here with us wherever and whenever we are. And so it's from the pen of this powerful prophet, this, this one who looks and peeks and peers into the future, sees things that are yet to be, and speaks prophetically and speaks with hope that we come now to Isaiah chapter 30. And because Reverend Monta has led us in the reading and the hearing, of the contextual environment, I will read simply ask you to follow me on verses 20 and 21. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, he will still be with you to teach you. In fact, you will see your teacher with your own eyes. Your own ears will hear him Right behind you, wow, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. I want to read that again, verse 21. Your own ears will hear him. Will you say with me, I can hear him myself. My God, your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, graduates, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. This is God's word for God's people. We give him thanks. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning, beloved, we gather to celebrate our graduates and to celebrate their accomplishments. And even as we do so, I want to consider to our graduates, but to all of us who are gathered online and in the room, that in this world in which we live, Uncle George, in this day and time that is filled, how shall I say it, with a plethora of options as it relates to the paths and the roads and the directions of our lives. On this Graduate Sunday, I, I want to preach about the power of one direction. The power of one direction. Those of you uh, who know me know that I have a great affection, a great affinity, and a great appreciation for poetry. Uh, now, Aunt Mary, I know, I know that makes me something Tracy of a dinosaur, and that may even make me something of a nerd, but I am proud of it. I, I am proud, I'm proud, Robin, that uh, as a man, a, a, as a, how shall I say it, without sounding uh, too, you know, they got this new thing now, uh, but Lee Hinton, this new thing called toxic masculinity. 
And uh, anytime, anytime, I'm trying to see where I can look for some refuge. Kevin, anytime a man stands up and seeks to be a man, uh, the culture lender in which we live now wants to label that as toxic masculinity. Now, now let me say this. There is, I guess, there is a thing called toxic masculinity, I suppose, but I will say this. What is often labeled toxic Toxic masculinity is no masculinity at all. Uh, beating a woman is not masculinity. I, I need help right here. Uh, uh, being, being a bully is not masculinity. Being mean and nasty and vicious and violent and full of vitriol is not masculinity. Abusing a child, taking advantage of the, of the elderly, our lips filled with vulgarity and profanity is not masculinity. And I think we got to redeem, brothers, we got to redeem this warped idea of masculinity from a culture that doesn't even know what masculinity is. A real man doesn't have to go around beating up somebody, cussing out somebody to prove they're a man. A real man is a man who is in touch not only with himself, but in touch with the God who made him a man. I do not, I do not, I do not, I will not, Ivana, apologize for being a man, a black man who loves poetry. I have a deep affection and affinity for the words of the poets. And, and I must admit, Deacon Sylvia, uh, I come to that not only because of the age in which I grew up, the era, the times in which I grew up, but because um, I grew up around a mother who loved poetry. I heard poetry in my home. I heard poetry in my church. I heard poetry in my school. Y'all getting quiet on me. Everywhere I turned, I heard poetry. Now I'm going to say this, and since I, I've already made most of y'all mad, I might as well make the rest of y'all mad too. We, we've got to stop letting our children only hear the vulgarity of rap music. We have to, Gene, fill their ears, their hearts, their minds, might, and their spirit with words that lift and lilt and take us to another level. We've got to fall in love with what was called, when I was in school, the romantic languages. <laughs> The languages of poets and bards and philosophers and scholars. Words that uh, lifted us and challenged us, that soothed us and comforted us and encouraged us. And at the same time, challenged us and corrected us. And so on this, uh, on this graduate Sunday, my precious graduates, I, I, I want to I talk about the power of One Direction. And I want to open the message with some words of poetry. Um, the first comes from, and I will not say all of them, just portions. Uh, the first comes from the pen of a man by the name of John Oxingham. Uh, some of you, two of you. <laughs> One of you besides me may know it, these words. To every man, I'll add person, there opens a way and ways and a way. And the high soul climbs the high road and the low soul trudges through the low. And in between, on the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. To every man, to every person, there openeth a highway, a way and ways. And each one must decide which way their soul will go. And then the words from Robert Frost. Two roads converge in the woods one day. 
And I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And then finally, these words from Solomon. There is a way that seems right unto a person, but the end of that way is death. Those words, two from the pens of poet, the other from the heart of Solomon, remind not only our graduates, but remind all of us today that before us in life are roads, paths that we can take. Here is the, here is the subject. Here is what you and I must grapple with and grasp and understand. It matters what road you take. It matters what path you pursue. It matters what direction your life is going. And here is what I would say to our graduates, but my God, I'd say it to all of us. None of us are wise enough in and of ourselves to choose the path of our lives. We need a better guide than ourselves. I wish I had help right here. Would you look at the neighbor and say, I know that's right. How many of us can admit that when we were charting our own course, when we were determining our own direction, when we were pursuing our own path, my God, look at where it led us. It was not until, I feel like preaching that, we turned the direction of our lives over to the God that made us did we find the path that we ought to be on. And there will be, I, I know, I know I sound like an old folky, but beloved, there will be many who will seek to lead us down paths, direct us down paths, to take us down paths. But you and I must stand firm and sure saying, my God is the one who guides the course and direction of my life. There is a way. Seems right unto a man, seems right unto a woman. But Solomon says the end of that way is death. Oxenham says to every one of us, there opens a way, capital A, and ways and a way. And each of us must decide which way our souls will go. And yet none of us are wise enough. None of us are astute enough. None of us are brilliant enough to make that choice on our own. And that is why the words in our text today captivated me when I thought about this Graduate Sunday, I've been in this series on the power of one, one delight, one desire, one determination, one demand. But for this Graduate Sunday, I saved for you this thought, one direction. Because if I could wish for those of you, particularly those of you graduating from high school, going to college, these next years of your life will be so determinative about the future of your life. And my burden for you is you don't get sidetracked or hijacked on the road of life. This may well be for some of you, the last time I speak to you as your pastor, pastor, I'll always be in some ways your pastor, but many of you will leave here, go to grad, go to undergrad, go to grad, and you will then get hired on a job, maybe in another city. You'll go ahead, find another church. This may be the very last time I preach to you as your pastor, pastor. So my last words to you, if that's the case, if that is to be so, please don't leave the direction of your life into the hands of someone not worthy to help you make the decision. 
How many of us, how many of us, Hazel, look back with regret that we listened to the wrong voices, followed the wrong advice, and went down a path. Looking back now, we wish we had never pursued. One direction. That is really what Isaiah says. Now, in order to appreciate this text, in order to appreciate this message, you will have to understand the context of it. Israel is in open rebellion against God. Okay, y'all missed it. Israel, God's chosen people, are in open rebellion against God. They have strayed, they have wandered, they have rebelled, they have resisted, they have rejected the commands, the will, the word, and the law of God. And they are getting the due fruits of their behavior. And yet God sends Isaiah with this word. That is, while correcting and challenging, comforting as well. I want to look at what this says to us today, and I'll let you go. There are three things, three movements in this text, not only for our graduates, but for all of us today. It's right here. The first thing we notice, watch this, is that God waits for us. L listen to verse 18, Smitty. The Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. You missed it. The Lord will wait that he will be gracious to you. Let me try it again. The Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Now, now here's what I mean. You missed it. I don't want to keep saying it. Here it is. God is patient with us. God, I wish I had a... In fact, the word the Bible uses is the word long-suffering with us. We see it in the life of the prodigal son, which is, as the late Lloyd Ogilvy says, really a chapter in the autobiography of God. Here is what Isaiah says about taking the wrong path, going in the wrong direction. Even when we stray from God, God waits on us. Okay, y'all not excited about that, but I promise you that I am. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that when I was messing up, God was patient with me. Okay, I guess I'm the only one, Tracy. I am so glad when I was out here cutting the fool, doing everything I was big, bad, and black enough to do. And let me say this before some of y'all get too happy, and I don't mean just before you got saved. Some of us since we've been saved. Just say amen or say ouch. Aren't you glad, Larry, that God waited on you? That God didn't cut you down when you were in sin? That God didn't cut you off when you were outside the ark of safety? That God did not let the bitter fruit of your lifestyle catch up with you? Somebody holler, he waited on me. Woo. That's the only reason I'm saved today. That's the only reason I'm here today is because we have a patient God who is long-suffering and he waits on us. I, 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 do, not, I do not know how to say it better because I cannot even scratch the surface of the profundity of that reality. We have a patient God who waits on us. While we are wandering, while we are straying, while we are rebelling, while we are rejecting him, he lovingly, patiently waits on us. He will wait for you. Woo. That, that's what Isaiah says to Israel. Yes, you are, you are in a place where God could strike you and smite you. But he waits for you. 
I want to say to somebody, not just my graduates, I want to say to somebody sitting here looking at me right now, you graduated 20, 30 years ago. And guess what? He's still waiting on you. God, I feel the Holy Ghost right there. You, you grown up in the church? Your, your late mother, your late father were good and godly people. And yet you decided, I don't want to have anything to do with church. I'll go Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. I'll be seeing me. <laughs> I'll show up when I have to. I'll come to weddings and funerals. But that's all. I had enough church. And God, all these years, who has been waiting on you? This, this God, this God that Isaiah lifts and wants Israel to look at as they are straying and wandering and walking away is a God who waits for us, who is patient with us, who is long-suffering towards us. I would remind you, though, that there is a limit to God's patience. There is an expiration, y'all not shouting now, to how long he'll wait. Uh, DP, when I was a boy, when you were a boy, they sang songs that reminded of that. Soon the harvest will be over and the summer will be o'er. Soon the day of offered mercy will be passed forevermore. He waits on us. I ask myself, Ivana, why? 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 How? How could a God so infinite in power, so mighty in strength, so majestic in holiness, put up with folk like us. How is he so patient? I think I came up with the answer. Are you ready? A. It's because God is conscious of our humanity. The Bible says in Psalms, he knows our frame <laughs> and he remembers that we're dust. On our best day, I done lost you now. On our best day, we are nothing but dust. I've told you over the waste of these 41 years, don't even brag about that because dust is not even dirt. It's the residue of dirt. <laughs> it's what's left over after dirt. God didn't even make us from dirt. He made us from the dust of the ground. From dust thou art, to dust you shall return. And our loving Sylvia, patient, long-suffering God. Do you know why he hasn't cut us down and cut us off? It's because God looks at us and is conscious of our humanity. I know this is going to hurt your feelings, but God knows there's nothing to us. <laughs> God knows how frail and fragile and feeble we are. Not only is he conscious of it, he is considerate of it. He takes into consideration our humanity. God, you know, it, it's sort of like, uh, I, was, I read something the other day. It, it struck me, and maybe because I'm getting older, it struck me. It said, uh, the next time you're impatient with how long it takes an older person to do something, Imagine how frustrated they must feel that they can no longer do it. <laughs> Man, that blessed my soul, Gail. That, Riley, that blessed me. You know, next time, next time you at the counter, you know, at Kroger or at Myers or, or at Walmart, and, and the older person in front of you is taking a little bit longer trying to get their pocketbook open, trying to find their wallet. Digging for change. Before you start huffing and puffing and sighing, 
Just remember they were once young like you. And it frustrates them to have to take that law. And here's the thing, keep on living and you're going to be slow too, okay? <laughs> Tell your neighbor, say, I know that's right. You keep on living with your fast young self. <laughs> you keep on living, rushing through life. Life will catch up with you. Slow your hips down. Would you look at the neighbor and say, be patient with me? Somebody over 60 say, I wasn't always this slow. <laughs> I used to remember everything the first time. <laughs> come on, come on, Lynette. I, I know I'm repeating myself, but I used to not forget I told you. So now, y'all send me some love. So now, I, I preface everything I'm going to say by, have I told you this before? <laughs> Leland, my, if, if I told you this, just tell me. I'll stop. <laughs> God, are, are y'all still with me? Tanya, God is conscious of our humanity. He knows there's not much to us. He knows we're nothing but dust, the residue of dirt, and God is considerate. He takes into consideration our humanity. He knows our frame. He remembers that we're dust. And then watch this. This is the point, Uncle George, Deacon Mary, it blessed me in my study because I get happy in my study before I come preach to y'all. The C point blessed me. Here it is. And God is committed to us in spite of our humanity. In other words, watch me, watch me. He doesn't let our humanity get in the way of blessing us. I don't know why y'all still sitting there because I promise you the old saints would have been spinning like a top right about now. That God says, I know there's not much to you. I know your frame is feeble and frail. I know you are human. I know you are fraught with frailty and humanity, but I'm not going to let that stand in the way of my blessing you and my using you. I don't know why you're still sitting here. I don't know why Tracy ain't up shouting because the only reason Tracy can hit those notes is because God is committed to Tracy in spite of her humanity. The only reason Winston can play like he plays is because God is committed to him in spite of his humanity. The only reason I can preach like I preach is because God is committed to me in spite of my humanity. And the only reason you still inhaling and exhaling is because God is committed to you in spite of your humanity. Somebody holler, thank you God in spite of my mess he is still committed to me. He takes into consideration my humanity. He is conscious daily of my humanity. And so watch this. So he waits on me. Ooh. He knows ain't nothing to me. He knows on my best day I'm dust. And so he patiently waits on me. Hasn't he done it in your life? Come on, y'all. Hasn't he, hasn't he done it? Here's the next point. I'm through. We got to hurry up. God is with us, watches over us, and he woos us. That's an old word. Y'all nothing about wooing. Well, y'all do remember Jeffrey Osborne. Can you woo, woo, woo? Okay. <laughs> Linda, Sylvia, stop it, stop it, stop it. Y'all don't know, that ain't in the hymn, though, y'all stop. Yvonne is looking around like, the what, the what? Can you woo-woo? <laughs> Let me leave it alone. That's W-O-O. -O. <laughs> God, is, everybody say, God is with us. God watches over us. And then God woos us. Even in our wandering. Listen to verse 19. 
For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. God, I don't know if I can even read this without crying. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. Woo! My God, that's a shout right there. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You will weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. Here it is. When he hears it, he will answer. Ooh. Oh, God. Oh, God. From the ends of the earth, I cry unto you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I am. Is there anyone here today who can testify without shame, without being embarrassed? There have been times when I cried to him, and every time I cried, he heard me. All right, all right, all right. Y'all ain't going to help me. Y'all ain't going to help me. Y'all ain't. No, but it's all right. It's all right. Because I know you tried to keep up the facade. I understand. You got an image. I don't have an image to keep up. Here's why I want you to be honest. Because you didn't just cry to him from that seat in the sanctuary. Oh, it's getting quiet. It's getting quiet. Tiffany, Tiffany, you and Chris, the kids, listen, you ain't just cried. I'm sorry, it's graduate Sunday. You have not just cried unto God from the sanctuary. Some of y'all cried to God from room 702 at the hotel. Don't play it and don't do it. And some of y'all cried to God from the crack house. And some of y'all cried to God from the bar stool. And some of y'all cried to God at the point of about to commit suicide. And some of you cried to God in the pit of despair and depression. And some of you cried to God in the lowest nadar of your sin. But wherever you, oh God, wherever you cried to him from, can you shout with me that he heard your cry? Pastor Rufus, that's why we love him. Would you turn to a neighbor, say, neighbor, you have no idea the places I cried to him from. Oh, God, I'm in bad. I don't want to tell you because you'll look at me funny the rest of my life. But if you only knew. The last place I cried before I showed up here. Woo. Because all you saw, all you saw was the Sunday I joined. You don't know where I cried to him the night before saying, if you let me live. If you get me out of this. If you save me tonight. I'm going to church in the morning. And you wasn't one of them lying folk because when you got out, you came to church. And all folk know is how you got here, but they don't know where you cried to him from. One commentator, Mike, says of this, and I quote, this line represents the unchanged character of God. Oh, I love it. The unchanged character of God. That even though his people had acted in defiance of him, rebelled against him, resisted and rejected him, he still claimed them and had plans for their lives. Some news is almost too good to be true. That on our worst day, he still claims us and has plans for our lives. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans, the thoughts I have for you, 
plans of good and not evil, Kevin, to give you a future, Barry, and to give you hope. I want to say this to my graduates. All, all my high school graduates, you stand. We have master's degree. All my high school graduates, you stand, please. You know Pop loves you. Look at them. Uh, we're going to celebrate them in a minute, but celebrate them one more time. Let me come over here to you. I'm going to tell you what Dad Cray told me one time. He said, now, Tim Tom, I don't know why he called me Tim Tom. My name is Timothy Joseph, not Timothy Thomas. He always said, Tim Tom, I'm going to tell you this. He said, now, I'm not telling you to mess up. I ain't telling you to sin. I'm not telling you to do anything. He said, but I'm telling you this. If you ever do, don't you wallow. You get up and you come back to God. I want every one of you to hear me today. I want you to live godly. I want you to give your life to Christ. If you haven't already today, I want you to give your life to Christ early. I'm not telling you to mess up. I'm telling you if you ever do, when you're away, when you're in school, and you fail one night, one morning, one day, you fall, bam, hit the floor with a sickening thud. I don't want you to lay down, and I want you to get up from there. And I want you to remember what your pastor's telling you. There is a God who will claim you and still has plans for your life. If you flunk out, if you fail, he still has plans for your life. Am I talking good here? I don't want them to think their failure is fatal or final. God is the God of another chance. And it doesn't matter where or how or when you fail, he'll give you another chance. God bless you, babies. Go ahead and sit down. The unchanged character of God. Even when they rebelled against him, my Mary refused to obey him, rejected his hand and his help. Looking instead, the text says, to Egypt for the help that only God could give them. God says, if you called me, <laughs> whoo, at the sound of your cry, oh, God, <sighs> I got I to gotta move, but I feel at the sound of your cry, I am um, tell this story on Deacon George R. Murray Sr. Oh, he's sick of me telling it. I got two great, well, three great George R. Murray stories. And one of them is when Cindy, well, not Cindy, when Tashian was born. Um, and uh, I think that Saturday, we were at the church for something. And I said, how's Cindy doing? And how's the baby? And he said, oh, they're good, they're good. And he said, you know, Pastor, he said, I was out in the hallway, and I heard the baby crying. He said, I know it's not true. He said, but I thought she was crying for me. <laughs> I know what that's like now that I'm a grandpa. <laughs> you know what? That's how God is. When he hears us crying, he says, they're crying for me. <laughs> Now, I want, I want you to hear me. And when he hears your cry, Kev, he doesn't just hear your cry. You know what he really hears? The prayers of your mother and your grandmother and your grandfather. And even, God, let me get through this, Lee. And even if he wanted to turn a deaf ear, something in his heart says, but their mama walked with me, and their daddy served me, and their grandmother asked me to save them. Oh, God, I thank you. God, I thank you. Be gracious unto you when he hears you cry. How does he do it? I'm glad you asked. Because A, he still loved them. B, 
B, because he still looked out for them. And C, because he still wanted to lead them. And that's not just true of our ancestors. Beloved, it's the same way with us. God wants to do the same thing. Well, Tracy and uh, Lee Hinton, here's the last one. God walks with us in the way we should go. Listen to verse 20 and 21. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink. Did y'all see the end clause of verse 20? He'll still be with you to teach you. Y'all missed it. Pop Logan, they don't know where to shout. Even when he's disciplining you, he's still with you. I wish somebody besides Deacon Didi would shout about that. Here's, here's what I know. If he's spanking me with one hand, he's holding me with the other hand. I need somebody to shout about that. That even, he says, even though I give you the water of suffering and adversity, even though you have adversity for food and suffering for drink, I will still be with you to teach you. And then listen, you will see your teacher with your own eyes. Some scholars say that's a reference to the Holy Spirit, not just the prophets. Your own ears will hear him. Here it is, graduates, on that campus, working that job, right behind you. <laughs> a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. Graduates, there'll be days you'll literally be standing on campus faced with a decision. Here's the promise. There'll be a voice. <laughs> Maybe it'll sound like the voice of PG. Maybe like the voice of your mother. Maybe like the voice of your pastor saying you know better. Oh, God. You know better. That's not God's will. That's not God's best. And if it's not the voice of PG or the voice of your parent or the voice of your pastor, it may be the voice of God in your heart saying, this is not the way I ought to go. This is not what I ought to do. You will hear a voice saying, this is the way to walk. The way you should go, whether to your right or to your left. Well, how do you do that? I'm glad you asked. Three ways, and I close. First of all, you got to listen to God. Everybody say, listen to God. Now, listen to your teachers. Listen to your professors. You got to do that because you got to get a grade. <laughs> you know, they got to grade you, so listen to them. And don't go in there fighting with them either, just because they have their degree. <laughs> I guess I told them, yeah, okay. You did tell them today. Marking period, they're going to say, I guess I told her. <laughs> listen, listen for that voice. Not only listen for God, you know what else you got to do? Look to God. I want to say this. I know some of y'all saying, now, Pastor, you putting a whole lot of stuff out here on us today. We only 17, 18. You putting a lot on us today. You can do it. Listen for God. And look to God. Say, God, help me. God, lead me. God, direct me. God, guide me. God, show me. And then listen for him. That's why you got to read your Bible every day. If you don't read but four verses, read because you never know what verse, what line will be God's direction for your life that day. Everybody say, listen to God. Look for God. And then here's the third one, and then let God lead you. I don't care how out of step it is with everybody. You may be the only person on your campus who's living the right way, but you keep on doing it. 
I know they'll laugh at you, they'll snicker at you, they'll talk about you, but here's what I want to promise you. In the end, you will be blessed because you chose to let God lead you. Mm -hmm. And if I could give the mic to all of these folk up in here, they would tell you every time I let God lead me, mm -hmm. he led me in the right path. Mm -hmm. Every time I listen to God, and every time I look to God, and every Every time I took my hands off the steering wheel of my life and let God guide me, he brought me to where I ought to be. I got to close because we got to honor the graduates. But would you tell a neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm so glad I let God guide me. I let God guide the direction of my life. And I let God guide the decisions of my life. And I let God guide the destiny of my life. And it hasn't always been easy, but I'm so happy today that he led me every step of the way. The old folks said, let Jesus lead you all the way, all the way from earth to glory. Let Jesus lead you. I wish I had old folk now all the way. Is there anybody? here who knows he's a mighty good leader he'll lead you he'll guide you he'll direct you he'll show you I feel like preaching now the path of life and afterwards receive you into glory would you turn 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 to one of your neighbors and say neighbor I don't just want him to leave me while I'm here, but on my pilgrim journey, I want Jesus to lead me all the way, all the way from earth to glory. Let Jesus lead you all the way. Is there anybody here that can shout with me all the way? My Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Could I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, hereby faith in him to dwell. And I know, and I know, and I know what ill befalls me. Jesus uh, do with uh, all things well. Would you grab a neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, you're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not wise enough. Let the Lord lead you one direction. You'll hear a voice in your ear saying, this is the way I am the way I am the truth I am the light he is y'all ain't gonna help me he is not a way not the way he is the only Am I right about it? Tell a neighbor, neighbor, I'm stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior. Let one direction let Jesus lead you all the way he's a mighty good leader all the way from earth to glory let Jesus lead you all the way he'll wait on you he'll watch over you and woo you and work with you because even in your wandering he still wants to lead you and you will hear a voice behind you say, this is the way. This is the direction when you have to go to the left or to the right. I beg you today, 
Let Jesus be your GPS. Let him give you turn by turn directions.